Let's talk about this study that you created. We talked about it a little bit before. Describe the study and what you found. We took TikTok, this new platform that most people don't know much about. It's um, really erupted out of nowhere. In the last couple of years, it's picked up you know, hundreds of millions, billions of users around the world. Two thirds of American 14 to 24 year olds now use TikTok. They use it for around, on average, 80 minutes a day. And of course, most parents have got no idea what's on there. So we said, okay, let's, let's set up accounts as a 13 year old girl. We'll set them up in four different countries. We'll set up um, and in the UK, US, Australia, and Canada. And we knew as well that a lot of parents were saying to us, you know, in private conversations, look, I am kind of, you know, there was that old public service announcement, it's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are? And they were saying, look, it's 10 p.m. I know where my children are, but I don't know who they're with. Because these platforms connect them to content from people I don't know who they are. I haven't had the chance to vet it. I haven't had the chance to talk to them about it. And they said, well, can you tell us what sort of content they're getting? What we found was incredibly disturbing. The TikTok algorithm within 2.6 minutes, so less than three minutes, had started feeding content uh, uh, which promoted self-harm to these 13-year-old girls. Within eight minutes, it was promoting content which was advocating, which was saying it's okay to have an eating disorder. I mean, I can't. It's really hard to sort of to describe it because that sounds so innocent, doesn't it? Saying it's okay to have an eating disorder. I'm saying stuff like saying you should eat 700 calories a day because that way you can have a nice body like me. And 700 calories a day, you and I know, is a starvation diet. It will, it will kill a child quickly. Their organs will shut down. They'll get right. dehydrated. They'll start burning muscle. Their brains won't develop properly. They can't think effectively. They will become even more confused and disoriented and more vulnerable. The, 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 really, the, the really disturbing finding that we had from this study, however, was this. We set up two accounts in each country, remember I said. One of them had a normal girl's name like Lauren or Sarah. The second one would have a similar name, but with we added the characters lose weight. So it was something like Susan lose weight. And what we found was for that account, that in only that one sense signaled vulnerability, it got 12 times the amount of self-harm content as the normal account and got three times the amount of overall harmful content as the normal account. Now, what that indicates is that it's likely the algorithm is, is identifying vulnerability, saying, you know what's addicted people that have names like this before, this kind of content, and is shoveling them more. The algorithm is doing what any algorithm program to keep people on platform for as long as possible would do. It's trying to find any sort of indication as to the psychology of the user and then saying, here's what we know is addicted people like that before. Okay, so people understand, because commonsensically, People would say, well, why would they give them self-harm information? Why is that going to keep them clicking more? Describe the emotional energy that goes into that that turns that into clickbait. Let me give you an example. The, the video might start with an, an aspirational image of a, of a slim young woman um, in, a, in a beautiful outfit. And then, and so people start watching it. They're, they're, they're drawn in by the imagery. But then very quickly, it, it starts showing you know, lines around the waist saying, if you want a waist as small as mine, what you need to do is have a 700 calorie diet. The thing is that the algorithm is looking for how long people stay on it. So you're drawn in by this aspirational image of a beautiful young woman. But what happens is very quickly, it starts to show you content about eating disorders. Now the, the algorithm knows that this person is vulnerable to that kind of content and it starts giving them more. Another example would be some self-harm content. So it'll be a picture of a razor blade with really emotional music. Um, and the, around the razor blade slowly appear the words, um, I miss the touch of you on my skin. That's the one I remember that makes me, um, it makes me, it, it chills me to my bone to think of a child seeing that and knowing the music, the image, which is so arresting. It's so, you know, it's kind of in that period in life when you are a little bit theatrical, your hormones are going 
bonkers and you you kind of you 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 are you are starting to empathize with pain you're starting to realize that the world might not be perfect and it's when kids becomes you know when they listen to grunge music well, that's what i listened to when i was that age you know you listen to grunge music and you sort of walk around feeling surly because you you're feeling kind of like an adult for the first time and it is giving them content that is saying it's good to cut yourself that's how it works it is so insidious and the platforms should be finding that content and going, crumbs, this is bad. Let's delete that content. And let's definitely, at the very least, even if they're not deleting, let's not promote it to 13-year-old girls who we know it might damage. The thing is, it's important to put yourself in that person's shoes, that person's frame of mind, and picture a 13-year-old girl that is searching for something because she's on there. and. She's maybe alone in her room, maybe doesn't have the best life, because we do know that one of the things that helps to inoculate those from getting addicted is if the other parts of their life, maybe they're in choir, maybe they're on the volleyball team, maybe they're active with friends, and they have a lot of balance in their life, which kind of inoculates them to that. But those that are kind of lonely, Maybe they're marginalized, they don't really have a peer group, they don't fit in well, then this becomes their reality, and they're alone with that content. It's kind of a precursor to, for example, eating disorders, because we know with a bulimic, for example, one of their goals, and I've had them tell me so many times, they get to a point where all they want is to be alone with their disease, just leave me alone. Let me go back in my room. I don't want to go out. I don't want to do anything. I want to get home as fast as I can and go back where you leave me alone with my disease. So here they are back in their room on their phone or their tablet or whatever. And they're just clicking and clicking and clicking. And it's just them and this content. They're so vulnerable. It is chilling. There is a reason why my me and my 20 staff who are across New York, Washington, D.C., and London do this work. We look at this content because we can think of what it must be like for those young people who are starting to realize their position in society, starting to think about boys if they're, you know, about sexual relationships and their physicality, their body is changing. They're extremely vulnerable. It's a terrify terrifying process. Your body changing fundamentally, hair sprouting where you didn't expect it before. They're very aware of themselves. And it it horrifies me the idea of a child being alone, exposed to this content, slowly being dragged into an illness. And you, you know, we talked about this earlier today. It's really difficult to treat these sorts of illnesses. Yeah, you know, they are fatal diseases. Eating disorders yeah. are fatal. They're one of the biggest causes of of one of the biggest uh, causes of, of of young mortality in the United States today, and it's it's really important that we as society pull together to do everything we can. The problem is that you know, you, me, parents, we are the sort of the the push for compassion for kindness in these kids' lives, but we're we're actually up against a kind of an opponent for the first time, and the opponent is. The greed, incompetence, and laziness of these enormous multi-billion dollar companies. And it's a really disproportionate battle. I mean, that's I, I am so so grateful to you for giving me the chance to talk about this to a bigger audience. But the truth is that the platforms in reality, you know, they are outspending us, outgunning us in Washington, DC and on the airwaves. Well, their lobbyists are spending tens of millions of dollars and the parents nothing. Because they're not organized. The the two biggest lobbyists in Washington used to be Philip Morris, the uh, the tobacco company, and Exxon Mobil, um, and now it's um, Google and well, it's it's big tech in short. Yeah. Um. And and that's a real problem for us. So we are having to to fight against these big vested interests as well to protect children, to protect society, to protect democracy, because that's what's at stake. It's lives.